let's honor and respect the Word of God. If you can stand, if you can't, we understand. But if you can, I'd like you to turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4. And we are beginning a new series today called Red Letter Living. Red Letter Living. And I want to begin this series by asking the question, what is it? What is it? What does this mean? In Matthew 4, 17 is where this is all kicked off. And we're going to focus on the Sermon on the Mount for many weeks and months. And it is loaded with material. If you want to know what is expected of a follower of Christ, I want to know that, don't you? When you cut through everything, when you cut through all the styles, when you cut through all of the politics, when you cut through all of the denominationalism, when you cut through all the stuff, I want to know what Jesus expects of us when it comes to following him. And that's what this is about, red letter living. Matthew 4, 17. Can we read it out loud together? Are you ready? From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I want to read it again one more time together, but I want you to understand this. Repent means make a U-turn. Are you ready? Out loud again. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I want to add one more verse to it. Matthew chapter 6, the same Sermon on the Mount, verse 10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. One more time. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, make it easy to preach today in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. may be seated. This new series called Red Letter Living. Red Letter Living is about reading, understanding, and applying the teachings of Jesus. It's that simple. Not just reading them, not just understanding them, but applying the teachings of Jesus. How many want to apply the teachings of Jesus? Red letter living is not understood by everyone. It's, it's, It's Christian living. It's the words of Jesus found written in red so that we can clearly identify his words. In our Red Letter Living series, I want us to focus on the Sermon on the Mount, and they're the very first words written in red in the book of Matthew. And in our Red Letter Living series, I want to to focus on this, and it it starts in the book of Matthew. The Sermon on the Mount, in his first teaching, offered to his followers, and it's designed to coach them up, to coach them up, to, it's designed to help them live as Christ wants us to live. It's designed to build us up. Jesus was about building up people. Did you know that? Jesus was about building up people. By that we mean developing, discipling, and coaching people into a better life. Now, I enjoy everything we experience in this family room on Sunday morning. I really do. I I live for it. I love to walk into this room and and be touched by God's presence as we gather together corporately and we suddenly become aware that he's been with us all week and my, 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 he's showing up today. I love that experience. I love to be touched by his spirit. I love to be around you and what we have in common. But if we don't figure out how to take it from in here to out there, if we don't figure out how to move it from here to there to where we truly become salt and light in the world, to where we live what Jesus says to live, and we live out what he says to live out, and we become what he says to become, and we ultimately come to a place to where we are who he says we should be, then we have failed, but Jesus calls us to follow him and his word. Can we give him big praise for that? That's what it's all about. Yes, yes, yes. Followers of Christ are different. Did you know that? Followers of Christ are different. And I want to tell you, in case you've never read the Sermon on the Mount or you've never read it in a while, you're in for a shock. It'll level you. Um, It's not just touchy-feely. Jesus has some expectations of us, and they can be accomplished. They can be accomplished. 
And not only that, they need to be accomplished in our lives. Um, the sermon begins with the Beatitudes, then it ingeniously is unpacked with practical heart issues, most of which are linked to the Ten Commandments. Let me give you an example. One of the Beatitudes is, blessed are the pure in heart. You all know that, don't you? Blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed, 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 there's about ten of them. Blessed are the persecuted. It ends with that. Now watch this. When you unpack each Beatitude, it is developed further in the Sermon on the Mount in a very practical way. Let me give you that example. Blessed are the pure in heart. Unpacked, Jesus comes along and says, But you have heard it said, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say, Whoever looks upon a woman with lust has already committed adultery. He moves from action to the heart. Every beatitude is reflected in the following three chapters after Matthew chapter 5 in a practical way. Jesus unpacks every beatitude and basically says, you want to see what this looks like? Blessed are the pure in heart. Woo! Blessed are the peacemakers. Oh, oh, I want to be a peacemaker until somebody makes you angry. Blessed are the pure in heart until a beautiful woman walks by who's not yours. Blessed are the pure in heart until something comes my way that I don't want to be pure in heart about. But let me tell you something. Jesus cares far more about the heart than he does your action. Because he knows if he gets the heart, right actions will follow a right heart. A lot of you do good deeds and right things for the wrong reasons. Well, this is getting good in here. I mean, you're all helping me preach. I'm telling you. I like this. It's getting good. You know, you know we, we do a lot of good things for the wrong reasons. We can go to church for the wrong reasons. We can pay tithes for the wrong reasons. We can belong to certain groups for the wrong reasons, all the wrong reasons. But Jesus sees the heart. He sees the heart. And Jesus wants to transform the heart and deal with the heart. He doesn't mind right actions, but he wants more than right actions. He wants right actions to be motivated by a right heart. Those who love me, obey me. Some act like they obey him, but they don't love him. When you love him, you obey him. When you love him, you'll have a pure heart. And when you have a pure heart, you watch the way you think and what you do. Can we give the Lord big praise that it all ties together? It's good stuff. <laughs> Blessed are the pure in heart. This whole idea of red letter living begins in Matthew 4, 17. You want to know where it all starts? Matthew 4, 17. Jesus has arrived. He's 30 years old, and he's ready to launch his ministry before the world. The world will never be the same after this. He's strolling along, picture this, on the Sea of Galilee. <laughs> he's on the shoreline, and he's overheard saying, Repent. Repent. Make a U-turn. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Um... Have you ever had something really built up to you as an awesome opportunity and then you, you got it or you saw it and it was like, this is it? Th th this is it? For thousands of years, this has been built up. But this is it? A man standing in a robe with sandals on the beach of the Sea of Galilee Simply saying, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is it. I had a friend years ago who uh, was building up his, uh, uh, this resort that he was a part of. And uh, he kept telling us, you need to go and rest. It's beautiful. It's luxurious. It's wonderful. And he kept pestering us, you need to go. You got to go. And I've so enjoyed it. Well, we finally took him up on it. We thought, well, we need a little rest. Let's go see how great this place is. And I'll be honest with you, we got there and walked in, and this is it? Are we in the right place? You, you ever been there to a this is it place? Come on. This is it? You had expectations, big expectations? If I can have this or I have that or... Or if I can get this job or have that job or make this amount of money and you get what you've been desiring and all of a sudden, this is it? 
I, I kind of think this is a this is it experience for these would be disciples, and they they had to feel this with a first encounter with Jesus. This is it. Can you picture this? Fr frame it in your mind. Jesus is standing there in the, in the, with, with all of his Middle Eastern garb, dressed in a common robe, wearing sandals, and he's saying it again. Repent. Make a U-turn. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And I don't know about you. I'd be saying, where? Where is this kingdom? What kingdom? What are you talking about? Kingdom? Where's the horses? Where's the military? Where's the... Where's the Technology, where, where, where's your captains? Where, 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 where's your organization? Where's your influence? What do you mean, repent? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. I, I, I have a feeling that some thought he was a nut job. And some did. Uh, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why? Well, not only what kingdom, but, but why? The kingdom of heaven is at hand? Where? What? Why? This is it. I think much like we get all worked up over misplaced expectations, disappointment had to set in with those first would-be disciples called out by Jesus in a big way. I'm going to call it kingdom disappointment in this first uh, point I see here as we launch the Red Letter series. First, they couldn't have initially believed or been moved by this because of the misplaced expectations. There, there are misplaced expectations. Um, they're unrealistic and they're faulty, and we get them all the time. And I'm going to say to you that we have them about Jesus today. If we really unpack who you think Jesus is and what he does for you, I'll bet there'll be 101 different definitions or ideas about that. Do you really know what Jesus expects of you? Do you really know who he is to you? Do you really understand all of his benefits? Do you really understand what he wants to be to you? But perhaps we can discover this through this Red Letter Living series. What he really wants out of you, what he really wants to do for you, what he, what he really wants to mean to you, what he really wants to do when he invades your life, how he wants every crook and corner, every part of your being, your spirit, your mind, your body, your soul, he wants to occupy it all. He wants everything. Yeah. Everything. So we need clarity on what all that means. We call ourselves Christian. We enjoy the goosebumps. We enjoy the yippee kind of experiences, and we should, and we ought to celebrate them. I'm not taking anything away from that, but you better figure out what he wants out of you. You better figure out what he wants out of you when all the hell breaks loose on the job tomorrow. You better figure out what he wants out of you when somebody goes crazy out on the road. You better figure out what he wants out of you when you're, when you're going along, and all of a sudden a blow in life comes, and a crisis comes, and you don't know how to handle it. You better figure out then where your faith is taking you. You better figure out what Jesus wants out of you and how you're to respond. So we look at this, misplaced expectations. You know, there was those Jews in that day. The Jews had four basic um, sects, S-E-C-T-S, groups, people groups, divisions among them. And they're called the Jews. There was the Essenes. Oh, they had their idea of what they wanted when Jesus showed up, when this Messiah was supposed to show up. Their idea was that the king would show up and he would be very political and he would bring great economic leadership and he'd bring the people, the Jews, into notoriety through great blessings and economic leadership, position, and power. And then there was the zealots. When they saw the king, when they wanted a Messiah, they wanted a great military leader, one like perhaps like David, a little bit of David. But they wanted even more than that. They wanted military leadership to do battle with those Romans who were abusing them. They wanted revenge. They wanted to go to war. They wanted to right every wrong. Those zealots, we got them among us today. Did you know that? There's the Pharisees. We got them among us today too. They were there, the king. They wanted a king, but they wanted him to return to the old law. They wanted to preserve it. Don't deviate from it. Don't mess with it. We have our interpretation of it. And bless God, if any other religious group comes up with another interpretation, they're out of here. We want nothing to do with them. That was the Pharisees. Then there's the scribes, the king. They wanted a king to bring reason and understanding, to apply all these great teachings, to learn, to evolve, to grow, to think. They had their idea. So you had these four Jewish groups. But you also on that day had the Romans. 
They wanted, you know, they wanted a great world leader, but he was to present himself with, he wasn't to present himself with this kind of humility. You wouldn't find a great Roman leader strolling along on the sands of the, of the, of the, of the Sea of Galilee, walking around with a robe and no, 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 no kingly attire and no military, no nothing. He's not going to what kind of king would do that? What a joke. Then there was those Greeks. Perfection. Oh, we'll take a king, but we want perfection in every way. Perfect the body, perfect the mind, perfection, perfection, perfection. Why would a Jesus, a king, a Messiah, a ruler of the world, present him in a way where he related to the common man? What kind of God would do that? So you had all this mess in that day. And the truth is that we all have these misplaced expectations ourselves. Oh, we want a king. We want a king, but we want a king when we get in trouble, we can just kind of dial a number and say, hey, I have a need. I need a healing, or I, I need a little finances, or, or I have this need or that need, and he's just a need-based king, but we don't pay attention to him when he says, I want to talk with you, and I want to walk with you, and I want to journey with you, and I want to walk with you through the fire, and I want to teach you something. I want to prepare you through your journey. I've got big plans for you in all of eternity. The world you're just passing through, it's not about this. Nobody wants to journey with him that way. We don't want to walk through hell. What kind of king do you want? You want one to relate? This is a king that relates. Or of a kingdom. What about the kingdom? This kingdom's different. It's not about the position you can achieve. It's not a position you want. It's not about that. It's about relationships. It's about relationships. This kingdom is built on relationships, and it begins with a relational Jesus who wants to call your sons and daughters and family and all of that. It's a bigger picture than just being a part of an organizational chart. It's about relationships. Can we give the Lord praise that that's the truth? Because that's the truth, isn't it? Well, then there's these kingdom values. Oh my God, this is where I find it tough. Kingdom values. Um, they're different. They go against every part of my flesh sometimes. And someone slaps me in the face and slaps me across my cheek, especially when I believe I can whip them. And even if I can't, it's sure fun trying. To stand there and take that, to have the internal fortitude and power to back up a bit and say, I'm capable of responding here, but I'm not going to respond out of revenge. We're going to unpack this teaching in the Sermon on the Mount later. I'm wetting your appetite. Now, you go to touch my family, you're going to find protector come out. You go to touch one of you who I consider my family in the city, you're going to find protector come out. Don't look at me that way. I'm a shepherd. I'm a shepherd. Someone picks on Danny, they should have pastor to deal with. You say, really? What kind of family is it that wouldn't stick up for one another? Come on. What kind of family wouldn't stick up for one another? We'll at least get the, uh, we'll at least get the facts. Um, the motives for responding out of the heart. This is this kingdom that, that looks at the heart for every action. What, what's moving you to respond the way that you're responding? What's going on with the heart? Um, these kingdom values are radical. And, and here's the tension. We're going to talk about this tension in just a moment. But this tension is, uh, I'm supposed to be this or am I becoming this? Am, am I already this or am I becoming this? Now, there's this tension in this. Uh, uh, most of us read this and say, I, oh, I want to grow in Jesus. I want to become that someday. And it's like Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. You're supposed to already be this this day. Uh, we make excuses. I want to get to that place. I got to pray a little more. I got to fast a little more. No, 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 no. It's about a decision in your heart. It's about letting Jesus have more of you and you becoming less of you. It's about you becoming nothing and him becoming everything. It's about you backing down so he can be lifted up. And that's what it's all about. It's about you giving up that he might live to you. That's all it is. It's a choice. Oh, come on. Let's give him praise that he's got transforming power with all of that and more. So you have these 
misplaced expectations, but then you have this meaningful expectation. Repent. Make a U-turn. And let me just tell you, you'll never see this unless you repent. This is going to sound like about, about a bunch of the most unbelievable, unthinkable bunch of jargon that's ever been spoke unless you repent and get a revelation of what it all means. To the non-repentant person, they will never see this because they're controlled by the flesh. Am I okay? That's why he begins this repent. Before he starts talking about kingdom and kingdom values, you've got to get the repent right or you'll never get the kingdom values. Am I making any sense? Um, there's this meaningful expectation. You've you got to make a U-turn. You cannot keep going the direction you're going because it's going to take you off a cliff. It's going to ultimately cost you your life. So you have to repent and make a U-turn. And when you make that U-turn, then this revelation will come and, and weakness will suddenly become strength. And what looks like a bad thing will become a good thing. And the mystery becomes revealed and kingdom values come to light and suddenly you start desiring the very thing that you detested. Uh, this is good. Um, let's take this further. Jesus doesn't want you and I to remain in a state of becoming. He cares about our present existence. It's not just a state of becoming, it's living in the state of being. And our Lord's expectations are expressed in the red letters and they're very clear for all of us. Once you're introduced to him and you make the U-turn and you follow him. Instead of following something else, you follow him. Instead of following the church, you follow him. The church's job is to promote him. Instead of following a denomination, you follow him. Instead of following your security, you follow him. Instead of following who you think your blesser is going to be, you follow him. It becomes all about him. Are you getting what I'm trying to say to you? So repent and make a U-turn and follow him. Come on, one more time. Give him the biggest praise of the day. That's what it's all about. Right there. That's it. That's it. It's not only about doing the right thing. It's about having the right heart. And you see, at first glance, and let me emphasize this, at first glance, it's like the kingdom is disguised. Um, to the unbeliever. Let's clarify that. And there's this tension in this for all of us. Blessed are you if you're persecuted. Turn the other cheek. Perhaps I keep bringing this up because it's the one I have the biggest problem with. It's, it's dealing with revenge in the heart and dealing with things with the proper motives. Anger without just cause uh, you're guilty of murder. Uh, you have heard it said, law, thou shalt not murder. I haven't murdered anybody. I'm pretty good. Jesus comes along and just blows that out of the water. I'm good. That's Pharisee stuff. I've never murdered anybody. I'm so good. I'm a good guy. I've controlled my anger. Jesus said, whoa, 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 whoa. Murder starts in the heart. If I wished someone to be dead because of my anger, I have already committed murder. Some of you think Jesus got you out of the law. He actually upped the ante. He didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill the law. And he moved from law to relationship so that when you have me living in your heart, I'll help you have the right actions for the right reasons. Those who love me, obey me. Before you can obey, you can obey today without loving. I could obey my father without loving because I knew there was consequences to my lack of obedience. But when I love and obey at the same time, it brings rewards and fulfillment because the love causes me to obey because I love him so much I don't want to disappoint him. Am I making any sense? You see, there's a big difference in all of this. It goes back to the heart again. And when you unpack all of this, it really comes alive. I mean, these kingdom values. Uh, pray for your enemies. What's that? Pray for your enemies. Some of you give lip service to that. You couldn't pray for Obama when he was president. Because you considered him an enemy. Many of you can't pray for Trump. Because you consider him an enemy. You didn't want Obama to be blessed. And some of you don't want Trump to be blessed. You can't pray for your enemies. 
Oh, pastor's getting right down where we live right now. <laughs> Let alone the guy on the job who tells me to go to hell. Let alone the boss that gives me a decrease because they've got a friend they're wanting to bring in and take part of my job. We don't pray for those people, but Jesus said, hey, when I get into your heart, I'll transform your way of doing things. You'll start doing right things for the right reasons because those who love me, obey me. It's all going to be about relationship with me, and there's nothing you can't do when I get in your heart and give you the power to respond. The tension is even carried further for me. Am I becoming a disciple or am I being a disciple? There's this journey of becoming that goes with the kingdom disguise. The journey of becoming. And no one will ever get it unless they repent. I've said this at first glance, I'm becoming. I want to keep becoming because I don't want to deal with what I got to deal with today. So let me just keep becoming. Am I okay? Boy, some of you need to read this. Get ahead of me. Um, then there's the second glance. After my U-turn, the mystery was revealed. Revelation came to my life, and instead of weakness, I found strength and power. Instead of a weak Jesus, instead of a weak king, instead of a weak one who's all by himself on the seashore of the Sea of Galilee walking along in sandals and a robe and nowhere to lay his head, Ah, instead of weakness, suddenly after repentance, I see power. Especially when I understand he owned the ground that he walked on. And he came to show you power because the easy way would have been, able, would have been to come with big white horses and military and power and swords and flames breathing out of his mouth. That would have been the easy way, but instead he showed you power to subdue power and to contain power. And I'm going to come this way. I'm coming in the back door with my kingdom values because through it all they're going to discover what real power means. You see it at the cross. Beat up, bruised, murdered, spit on, abused. To the non-repentance, I would say, you call that power? That is nothing more than a picture of weakness. But oh, 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 oh. When you understand he subdued himself because he had the power to say, drop dead into hell with you, and didn't. He didn't. Instead, love reigned. That is the ultimate act of power. That's, you will not find a bigger act of power that's ever been manifested on this earth. Power. You find it here, this journey of becoming. Um, again, turn the other cheek is an act of power instead of an act of weakness. Instead of failure, I found faith and a future. But I'm not just becoming, I'm supposed to be in a state of being. And what people don't understand is red letter, red letter, letter living is about the heart and relationships. You've heard it said, but I say to you, thou shalt not murder, but whoever's angry in his heart without just cause has committed murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say to you, whoever's committed in his heart has already committed it. Revenge, turn the cheek. It's all about the heart. Jesus moves from the law to the heart. And what has now shifted in the kingdom is Jesus moves from obedience to relationship. It's more than obedience. He wants more out of you than obedience. But when he gets you, you will obey for the right reasons because you love him. The kingdom is deliberate, and I'll close with this. Behind the initial disappointment is heaven, eternal reward, fulfillment. You've heard it all said before. You've heard it said that there is death after life. You've heard it said behind every loss there is a win. You've heard it said behind the decrease is an increase. You've heard it said, have you not? But you'll never get it unless you repent and let Jesus reign in your life and get more of you, more of him and less of you. More of him and less of you. It will appear to be weakness. You know what the world thinks of us? You know what the world thinks of Christians? You're weak. You're weak. The world thinks you're weak. And the world thinks that you need a crutch. And that's why you fabricated somebody in the sky. 
that's supposed to be a savior, but it's weakness in their eyes. But no, 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 no. I'm telling you, we don't serve a weak one. Oh, this world's about to find out soon and very soon. We don't serve a weak one. He displayed his power through weakness. He displayed his power through humility. He displayed his power through poor spirit. He displayed his power in all of that and brought himself under subjection so that you could discover the power of the Holy Spirit in your life and one day when he comes back, you're not going to see him walking around like a weak, limped, little <laughs> nothing. The Bible says he's coming back ruling and reigning as king of kings and lord of lords. And every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We can give him praise. We can give him praise for that. We can give him big praise for that. Satisfaction, a life of power, joy, self-control, Christ's identity, so rewarding, filled with destiny and life. That is what red letter living is all about. And we're going to journey verse by verse, pericope by pericope, section of scripture by section of scripture through the next three chapters, and you're gonna, gonna discover life-changing <laughs> invitations to grow in Him, to become one who is in a state of being beyond one who is constantly trying to become, but to give up and be instead of becoming. Is Pastor making any sense? Uh, we're gonna take communion. I want to invite you to consider this. Everything in the Sermon on the Mount is displayed on the cross. Jesus dealt with his anger and subdued it to where he never wanted to murder. Thou shalt not murder, but I say unto you, whoever is angry in his heart without just cause against a brother hath committed murder. Everything you find, the whole, all of the Beatitudes were on display at the cross, a pure heart. Blessed are the persecuted. Blessed are the peacemakers. You can walk down through all 10 of them and they're all displayed on the cross. You can look at all the practical application and link it up to every beatitude throughout the following three chapters and you will find it displayed on the cross. That's why the death of his body, the shedding of his blood and his resurrection are so important to us because that's the picture of power in red letter living. Do this in remembrance of me. You wanna see red letter living? Then understand the pen is loaded with red letter blood. It's stroked in blood. And it all becomes a reality as we repent and discover him and his fullness so that we can live for him and be a disciple instead of becoming a disciple. Am I making any sense? So when you come today, if there's any area of your life that you need to make a U-turn, you're going to walk up to this table and you're going to make a U-turn. And when you're in one of these turns, would you say, Father, help me to make a U-turn in my heart. I have hate in my heart against someone. Father, help me to make a U-turn because I'm finding myself struggling with my humility. Help me to make a U-turn because I'm not that person. I'm struggling in my mind with things I shouldn't be struggling with. Would you help me to make a U-turn? I repent. And as you make the turn,
make the spiritual application and let his blood that we're about to partake of by faith in the cup, let it become a life-transforming, powerful experience that washes you and I clean. How many want to be washed clean in this room today?